Okay, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce Florian Rabe from uh, it's, Elange. It's funny, we're not seeing a Slovenian warning ah, that we're yes, being recorded. Because Zoom is intelligent. The Slovenian warning is warning you that the thing is that the talk is being recorded. Uh, I haven't figured out yet how to tell it that not everybody uh, who's participating is Slovene. Uh, so uh, Florian is going to uh, speak about uh, MMT, and I'm sure he's going to tell us what MMT stands for, so I'm not going to give that away. Um, so uh, without further ado, Florian, the floor is yours. Is my screen sharing working? I can see your screen, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it disappeared when you started recording. Okay. Yeah, so thanks for having me at the seminar. Um, it's a very exciting idea. I'm very happy you started the seminar and I'm very happy to, to present MMT here. Let me tell you right away that MMT is not exactly a proof assistant. It also has extremely broad interests and I had no idea who would attend the talk. So please ask as many questions as you can to make sure I'm actually talking about the things most interesting to the audience. I have about three times as many slides as I can go through. So I have a lot of room to, to adjust the focus of the talk. Let me start by preaching to the choir a bit. Proof assistants are great, but if we're honest, they haven't actually had that much impact in the real world, at least not as much as they could have and arguably should have. We have to reach much larger application scales. Like in fact, we're currently losing out in the sense that the actual real life software verification needs are growing faster than our ability to, to verify software and our applications must become a lot cheaper so that people can actually pick up proof assistance. Currently, the time it takes to learn how to do it and the time it takes to actually do it are so high that they scale off a huge potential usership community. But building proof assistance is really, really hard. There's a huge there's a couple of extremely difficult bottlenecks. We have human resource bottlenecks and knowledge management bottlenecks. I like estimating that it takes about 100 person years to actually build a really usable system, meaning all the way from designing the logic to having a large library that can tackle practical problems. Maybe recently we're seeing that this number goes down. Certainly systems like Isabel and Kark have 100 person years investment into them. Lean appeared very quickly and is still pretty use, it's already pretty usable. So maybe we can build future systems faster, but even so, it's a huge investment. And we've seen that when we reached new scales in using proof assistance, we had a very different problems than we thought about 30 years ago. So one of my favorite examples is that sometimes reproving a theorem can be faster than finding it in the library, even if you know it's somewhere in the library. So we're still doing a lot of research on how to build our systems with less resource investment, how to build systems with better knowledge potential. And we're not even done with the basic design of the systems. We're constantly coming up with tweaks to the logic with entirely new logics. A recent trend in established systems has been to allow the user to customize how the system interprets the input. That's something that started in SS Reflect. It's now often called unification hints. And especially systems like Idris and Lean have been very successful at, at using meta programming, where the user can change the behavior of even the kernel from within the user interface. We're adding entirely new features to our language. We have kind of reached a plateau and the kind of features that the proof assistant really needs. 
but we're still experimenting with new ones, always coming up with better ideas. And we've even built entirely new systems, both at the theoretical level and at the practical level. And I keep seeing, saying we here, of course, I mean with we the entire community. I wasn't personally involved in any of these efforts, but as a community, these are some of the trends we've been seeing lately. So before you get the wrong idea about MMT solving all of the problems I've just described, I thought it's wise to have a bit of a disclaimer. So MMT is very much rooted in the proof of systems larger community. Those are the conferences I go to, but the inspirations I take, it's very much motivated by the same problems, but it's not really in itself a proof of system. And doing theorem proving was never the ultimate motivation and it's not the primary purpose of the system. So what it primarily is, it's a framework in which we can define and implement formal systems to then reason both in and about them. It allows building your own libraries, but it also has been carefully designed to allow importing existing proof assistant libraries. That's something I'll mention later. We now have imports of about a half dozen major proof assistant libraries like Isabel Koch, PVS, and so on in MMT. And MMT is also designed to allow integrating those libraries so that you can work with all of them at once. That's mostly future work. The framework is there, but it hasn't been leveraged yet. And I'll come back to that in a bit. And maybe one of the unique features of MMT, it's very aggressively trying to allow building whatever support tool you might need in a language independent way. So IDE, type checker, whatever, I'm trying to develop it without committing to the language I'm using. That started simply because in the beginning, I didn't know which language I would need 10, 20 years down the road. So I decided to just try to abstract as much as I can from the specific logic I'm working with and still try to build a scalable system on top of that. So one of these language independent support tools would be a proof assistant. So why does MMT not have one? I don't think it's an inherent design flaw. It could be done. In fact, I do have one. It's just a proof of concept that can only prove extremely trivial theorems. One would have to put in a lot of work now to actually become competitive. That's something every proof assistant developer knows. It's easy to get started. It's very hard to be really, really good. It also makes it difficult for student projects, especially in a system that isn't committed primarily to building proof assistants. It's very hard to get undergraduate and graduate students to write and publish papers if they're working on a proof assistant. And also, I'm still not entirely sure yet how I would want to build it. I do want to have a proof assistant on top of MMT eventually, but it's clear that a logic independent prover would always be weaker than logic specific ones. So I think the ultimate system has to combine logic specific proof technology and logic independent technology. I mean, logic independent technology can be great at bridging gaps across libraries. If you need to combine theorems from different proof assistants, that's where an MMT based proof assistant will shine. But if you need to prove a specific, extremely deep theorem, you will most likely always dive down into extremely sophisticated, highly optimized logic specific provers. So I figured I would have lots of people in the audience who have no idea what MMT is. So I tried to come up with some slogans. Take these with a grain of salt because 
Well, it's obviously not possible to describe a complex system in just a simple slogan. But of all the proof systems that exist in motivation and design, I think Isabel is the most similar, except MMT doesn't build in the lambda calculus in the way Isabel does. So if you take the current Isabel system and rip out the logic kernel and instead allow putting in an arbitrary type theory, you would have roughly the, the basic design of MMT. Except, of course, Isabel has some at least 10 times as much developer here is going into the system, probably even more. If you know logical frameworks and you've maybe heard of the 12 system, that's the one I grew up with in my PhD thesis. And when I worked with 12, one limitation I always hit was that LF is great as a logical framework, but it doesn't always work. It's not always the right framework. So I wanted to be able to change the logical framework flexibly, something that you simply can't do if you're working in a specific framework like 12. So one of the motivations of MMT was to just build a 12-like system, but without being boxed in once and for all to LF. I've checked out the drometer recently. I'm not very familiar with it, but my somewhat superficial impression is that I would classify Andromeda as a very specialized system that if I had to recreate it, I would probably do it as an MMT plugin. Meaning Andromeda tries to pick a specific family of type families and be flexible in which one is actually in the kernel and then build a proof assistant based on that. So I think that's very much in tune with how you define formal systems inside MMT. And finally, I've already mentioned that we have done a lot of imports of proof assistant libraries. That go, ultimately goes back to the QED idea from the 90s. So in a way, we've actually done it now, some 30 years later. We have some major proof assistant libraries in the same system now. However, we've just finished with that project. The next big step will be to actually connect them. So far, we have them in the same system, but they're still side by side. We're still missing the bridges that allow porting theorems from one library to another. So I mentioned logical frameworks already. For those of you who have never heard that term, let me quickly define a logical framework as a logic in which we can define the syntax and semantics of other logics. Most famous representatives would be Altamath, Elef, and Isabel. The main advantages of logical frameworks are that we can have extremely clear, extremely universal concepts, which we can implement once and for all. And they're extremely good for rapid prototyping systems. You have a new type theory you're experimenting with, just define it inside the logical framework, and maybe you get a type checker, a theorem prover, a module system, an IDE out of the box. Isabel has been extremely successful along those lines, although nowadays it's mostly focused on the Isabel whole incarnation. And of course, Isabel lacks the ability to handle arbitrary type theories like dependency type ones, for example. But one problem with logical frameworks was that they're also extremely divergent. It's unfortunately not the case that we can just use one logical framework and define all formal systems. We have about a dozen or so logical frameworks around, all with their pros and cons. I think Brigitte is speaking in one of the upcoming talks about Beluga in this seminar. And most frustratingly, even if we take the union of all of these frameworks, I mean, nobody has done that yet, but even if we did, we would still not really be good enough. We can represent what I call textbook logics, like first order logic, high order logic, really nicely in logical frameworks. Those are basically the hello world examples. We, already, we could already do those in the 90s. 
But if you look at real life logics, like the soft type system of MISA or the decision procedures of PVS, we really can't capture those nicely in any logical framework at the moment. And that's extremely frustrating. So that's why I developed MMT. I figured, okay, logical frameworks aren't good enough yet. So I need to improve the frameworks, but I don't know in advance how to improve them. That's why I put MMT one layer above so that I'm flexible even in the choice of logical framework. The ambition of MMT is quite grand. This is something that started with my PhD thesis and I'm still not really done with it. It was meant to be a framework that can capture all the different formal systems that are around that the community has developed and try to identify their connections, try to integrate their libraries. So that was the high level motivation. I want to dive in a little bit now and give you some details about what we've been doing with the system and, and how it developed. The first thing I did that was just after my PhD thesis, I was part of a project together with Till Mosakowski at DFKE Bremen and Michael Kohlhase at Jakobs University in Bremen. The, we called it the Latin Atlas. The idea was to build a network of formalizations of all the logics that exist. Means every connective, every quantifier, every type theoretical feature is defined in its own module. And then individual logics can be built by just combining the building blocks. So think software engineering technology applied to logic design. So you could call it logic engineering. We wrote about a thousand modules. We used the fixed logical frameworks then, the LF system. At the time still implemented in 12. By now I've migrated the content to MMT. The Latin Atlas was huge. So I was very happy when we were in Paris once to have such a big screen so that I could actually for the first time see the entire atlas of the formalizations. To give you a better understanding, I have a zoomed in version here. We said every logic is formalized as a theory or you can think of it as a module in, in LF and connections between logics are then defined using theory morphisms. So for example, here you see propositional logic imported into first order logic, first order logic translated into higher order logic, higher order logic interpreted in set of C-set theory, and set of C-set theory eventually translated into the MISA set theory. If you zoom in even further, say zoom in on propositional logic, you see the individual modules, like for negation and conjunction formalized individually. And if you zoom in even further, the syntax proof theory and model theory of conjunction are formalized in individual modules. That way you can very flexibly combine the different connectives to get the system you want. So at this point, I want to switch to a more concrete example. In actual MMT. So what you see here is the MMT user interface based on JEdit. So I'm, I'm trying to make this look as close to an IDE as possible, very much along the same lines as Makarios has done for Isabel. So you see the tree structure of your formalization on the left, including all the reconstructed type information. And we have something like an error list at the bottom. So is the font size good enough for everybody? Speak up if you complain. So 
So something that I've done recently, I call it the Latin 2 approach. I'm restarting the Latin formalization from scratch about 10 years later using much improved technology that I've developed since then, trying to be even more modular, even more systematic. And I copy pasted a couple of fragments of the Latin 2 formalization into this one file. If you want to look at this file yourself, I'm going to paste it into the Zoom chat. So this is the exact file that I'm currently looking at. And I'm going to walk you through this formalization. The idea of this is to abstract exactly the um, ontological fundamentals and then build the various type theoretical features on top of those. So we have a single theory just for any formal system that does have propositions. Still using LF as the meta theory here, so the type is a primitive of LF. Everything else, but LF is itself defined in MMT, and I'm saying up here that I want to use LF as a logical framework right now. Then any form of system that has proofs is something that must include propositions, of course, and then must have a type of propositions, a type of proofs for every proposition. The hash introduces a notation, so I'm using the turnstile first argument to refer to the type of proofs, giving it a negative precedence to save brackets. And then I can say a logic is anything that includes propositions and proofs. a base theory for anything that has terms, a base theory for anything that has types. And here we already see a big split. There's two ways of handling type theory. There's lots of ways of handling type theory, but two fundamentally different ways are like the, the key paradigms. I call them the church and the curry approach because they go back to the various lambda calculi defined by church and curry. So we have the church approach where every term carries its type, also called the intrinsically typed version, meaning terms go from the types to the type of logical framework, meaning TMA is the type, is the object is meta logic type representing object logic terms of type A. Then we have the curry version where terms are typed extrinsically, meaning terms are independent from types, and we have a binary predicate between them that gives us the typing relation. So almost every type theoretical feature can be built either on top of the church representation or the query representation, and we can have translations between them. So that's something I try to capture in the formalization. So if you want to go to higher logics, we need kinds. And then we have kind of types here in church style formalization. For this example, I've taken out universes. Universes work as well. But it gets a lot more awkward, I think. We still need better logical frameworks to really elegantly capture universes. And then we can do a bit of boilerplate, untyped logic has logic and terms, type logic has logic and type terms, soft type logic has soft type terms and logic. If we want to define something like higher order logic, neither of those is good enough because in higher order logic, we don't really have propositions as something separate from terms. Propositions are just terms of type Boolean. So I call that internal propositions. We have a type of Booleans in the object logic. And then our propositions is anything of type bool. So the MMT module system has an object-oriented flavor. So this realized declaration you can think of as implementing an abstract interface. So the theory of propositions demands that I have a type prop, which I now have to define. So I'm defining prop to be TM of bool. So as from now on, I can use this theory as if it included propositions. Question? Yeah. 
So should we read this prop equals TM bool more like a definition or like a judgmental equality? What is its status? It's a definition, yeah. So it would automatically unfold. The anti-type checker is aware of it. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Slightly more complex example, if we want to go to set theory, we need to have an element with relation between terms. So you can think of term as the type of sets. That's why I'm using this suggestive notation here. Now, I want to introduce type system in set theory. I have two different ways of doing it. I can either say, well, the sets are at the same time the types. Of course, there's types as objects. I'm implementing soft type terms by saying, OK, my types are the terms. And the relation between types and terms is the elemental relation. Or I can interpret types as predicates, where the types and all the unary predicates on the terms and the elemental relation is just application. So I have two different ways how set theory can implement type theory, both represented here as different implementations as of the abstract interface, both inducing a theory morphism from soft type terms into the theory of internal types. So you don't have to understand this in detail here. I just wanted to have one slightly more advanced example to, to show you what the system can do. Roughly, if you take the intuitions from an object-oriented language like Java and apply it to logic formalizations, then this is roughly what you're seeing here. OK, so this is, for this example, the set of base languages that I want to support. So I have enough to build first R logic. I have enough to build higher R logic. I have enough to build set theory. Let's add equality to the various systems. I want to add equality to untyped logic. That's easy. Equality is just a binary relation on the terms. I can then define reflexivity and congruence in the usual way. I don't want to go into too much detail here but I'm always available for questions. Alternatively, I could have typed equality, where equality is now a relation between terms of type A, meaning it has to take the third argument for the type at which we're taking equality. Reflexivity and congruence work the same way. And I've done a couple of example proofs here just so that you can see how proofs would be done in principle. For example, here I'm applying congruence to prove that y is equal to x, which discharges the proof obligation needed to show the symmetry of equality. When you're working with a logical framework, most of the proofs are relatively short and shallow. So by now, I've become so good doing all these proofs by hand relatively quickly. Obviously, a good proof assistant would be helpful here to save some work. And now we can build on that to define types theoretical features. As example, I have now written a couple of definitions of function types. So again, fully modular. Simple function types are just a binary operator on types. And then I can introduce simple functions using a lambda operator and apply operator and a beta conversion axiom. All of this is reasonably straightforward, and I think you could write down the same thing in Andromeda, and you probably have. If you want to go to dependent function types, we need to have a different function type operator. That's this guy for the pi now rather than the arrow. And we all know that simple function types are a special case of dependent function types. So I can now use my 
object-oriented flavor again to implement the interface of simple function type to say that simple function just take two types and then give me a pi back where the x doesn't occur in the body of the pi. So I can capture the fact that my theory of dependent function types implement as a special case the theory of simple function types. I can then define dependent functions in the usual way. I can also now realize the interface of simple functions. I've skipped that here for the example. And finally, I could go also to soft type functions and soft dependently typed functions. I don't want to go into all the details here. I just wanted to give you a feeling for the scope. If you start with the idea of formalizing all logical systems, already just to handle function types, you suddenly have to cover like a half dozen or a dozen different systems, depending on which base theory you're using, typed, untyped, soft typed, internally typed, and then depends on whether you want, to, want them to be simple or dependent. And of course, that in itself can then be combined with different kinds of equality. Do you want extensional, extensional, intentional equality, and so on? So already for function types, this thing explodes massively. And then you have to start writing all the different translations between these as theory morphisms. I didn't put that in the example, but you can, for example, translate dependently typed into soft dependent types and so on. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So can you comment a little bit on how you're treating contexts and free variables here? Is this just because you said at the beginning, you say that you're going to use LF, so we're doing this LF style, or is this? Right, so this is all LF, high on abstract syntax style. Mm -hmm. In fact, everything I've shown you here could be done just as well in LF. So I haven't used a different meta theory yet. Mm -hmm. I don't go into different meta theories in the examples I've selected because I figured I wouldn't have time. But it's very easy to come up with things that you cannot do well in LF. Like something like proof irrelevance doesn't work well, or throwing in arbitrary rewriting rules, algebraic simplification, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. In LF, I was just stuck. That's why I built MMT. And now I can do that. Whenever I've come up with a new rule that I would like to try out, I just implement it and add it to the system. I want to tell you, so this was kind of the, the low level view, what you start with. You can now build that up, build all the different modules, eventually use that to build the various logics you're working with. And I want to show you the opposite view, the big picture view where we have worked on importing proof assistant libraries now relative to these logic definitions we've made. This was a joint project that is just about to conclude with Michael Kohlhase in Erlangen. So we picked six representative proof assistants and said, okay, we want to take their libraries and export them into MMT. That really did take six years. The effort that went into that was massive. I have one recent paper which you may find interesting to read on that. I'm putting the link into the Zoom chat. Where in particular we give some more statistics and some details about how hard it was. So the basic idea is we formalize the appropriate logical frameworks in MMT. Then we formalize the logics in that logical framework. And then we get the libraries of the systems relative to those logics. So the red part is manually written in MMT. And the bottom parts are automatically generated 
by writing exporters from the various systems. So all of those are available in the GitLab installation where we have like all the imports of the various proof systems are available in our GitLab installation. I've collected a couple of statistics here. The most impressive one is the import of Isabel because that was the last one we did. So we knew exactly how to do it. The cock import is deceptively small because we did it last year and at the time they had just switched to a new version. So many of the existing COG libraries didn't run with the latest COG version. By now the situation has cleared up a bit. So if we reran the COG import, we would have much bigger numbers here as well. Sorry to uh, always ask me be asking the questions, but can I ask also, so if you go one slide back, for instance, you say that you are importing GAP and Sage. So does that mean that you're just import, you're just trusting those systems and you're just importing the statements of theorems or you're you're importing proofs and rechecking them? What exactly are you uh, importing? For GAP and Sage, we throw away the implementations and just import the method interfaces. And not we tried more, but it's very, very hard. And it ultimately wasn't worth it. So, so for instance, I don't know, Sage, Sage math. Okay, so but Sage has things like symbolic computation. What does it mean to import those? Like there's a bunch of algorithms uh, in there. Yeah, so Sage uses um, a set of carefully designed categories, and that's what we ah, I see. focus okay. on importing. So to speak, the ontology of Sage is important. Yeah, and then a lot of what the concrete implementations of those various categories in Sage we haven't looked at in that much detail. Uh -huh. And if you take something like clock there, you are importing the proof objects and everything? Right, so for the theorem provers, the question is, the, analo the analogous question is, how do we import all the proofs? So the situation varies quite a bit across systems. For PVS and MISA, the situation is that those are not small kernel systems. They do a lot of stuff which they don't even trace and instrumenting them would be extremely difficult. So there the state of the art is we get partial proofs to the extent that the systems have them, which have lots and lots of gaps. For COG, we had a huge scalability hazard because it's just so huge. We exported all of the proof terms down to the lowest level, but we used a very efficient untyped representation in LF because it would have been infeasible to get the entire clock library relative to a typed representation. So Florian, can I jump in here? Yeah. Um, so for Cock, for instance, uh, there's a lot of uh, computation built into the type checker. Uh, so when you say you exported the proof term, um, right, we export whatever COG stores in the end, and you're right, that means a lot of computation is not in the proof terms, because COG, they're primitive in the COG type theory, so they're not part of the proof terms. Right, so that brings, us to, um, that brings us to Isabel. So it's, it's Isabel, not the goal to have recheckable proofs imported. Uh, let me get back to that in one minute. Let me contrast Isabel with Cog. For Isabel, there's no primitive computation. That means all computation is ultimately done via applying equality rules and therefore does show up in the proof terms. For Isabel, exploiting proof terms would simply not have been doable. So we skipped them entirely. So this is a frontier of research, how to get proof terms out of Isabel. Okay. And now, for your question, is the goal to have recheckable proof terms? It's one goal. It's probably the goal that's farthest in the future. 
So to get recheck of the proof terms and actually recheck the entire library for any of these big libraries is probably another five to 10 years if you really aim for it. Well, yeah, you don't, sense. thank you. You don't really, like let's take Isabel where uh, when it performs an equality step, it goes through the kernel, right? Yeah. And so you don't actually need to produce these huge proofs that you would then munch on. What you would really need is, one of the things we're trying to think about here in Ljubljana is, as you run Isabel, you want Isabel to sort of tell somebody else, like MMT, I'm now doing this, I'm now doing this, I'm now doing this. And then MMT is also just replaying the computation as it goes along. I think right so for that you have to it's doable but you have to then re-implement a lot of the stuff that isabel is doing right you would have to at the very least re-implement the isabel kernel so that it tells you what it's doing and right. so you have so, some books in there i agree just re -implementing the kernel, that would require getting the low level proof terms out i think the more promising approach will be to come up with a good understanding of what like high level or mid level proof terms are so that we can export exactly enough information so that other systems can redo the proofs, but not more than that. But that trade off is really hard to get right because every system is so highly optimized and is doing so many sophisticated things. It's very easy to just omit too much and then no other system can redo the proofs. Okay, thank you. And moreover, if you instrument the systems to get the exports, very often the only thing you can realistically get is what the kernel sees. And at that point, it's already too late because you see all the low level steps, and it's at that point too hard to reintroduce the high level proof structure originally written by the user. So I think what we need to do next is really as a community agree on a good format for proof interchange that has enough high level information in it so that we can port proofs across systems. So therefore, we can't currently recheck proof terms for any of these large provers. We can do it in principle for Isabel and Koch if we only export smaller proofs, but running it over the entire library would be infeasible. Let me give you a quick idea of the scale that you have to be prepared to work with. So just instrumenting Isabel and exporting the entire archive of formal proofs gives you some 20 hour processing on a very fat machine. We ended up with 65 gigabyte. Sorry, I mixed up the measurement. No, okay, 65 gigabyte XML, 310 megabyte compressed. So that's the typo here. So that was just doable with current technology and that's skipping all the proofs. So that gives you an idea of the unity or at one or two orders of magnitude if you want the proof terms as well. Now I'm nearing the end of one hour. This is as good well, a point as any to stop, maybe. So we should roughly use up one hour. If you want to go longer, a little more, if you have something to say, that's okay. But we could also just open up the discussion. And if the discussion gets going, then I think it will be easy to use up the one hour. It's up to you. You, can, you, could, you could also decide to go on a little more. If, I don't know what else you were going to say. And as I said, I prepared a lot more material than I could ever get uh, through. So. Okay. So maybe I would be interested in hearing a little more about what uh, 
what's the sort of meta theory that you really support? Like this business where you have a signature and then you have your constants and like if you could say a little bit more about that. So what's what what's the what's what's the what's at the foundation? Yes, let me skip to this slide then. So MMT uses an extremely generic concrete syntax, uh, abstract syntax underneath. There's globally defined names, locally defined names, and complex terms, which may or may not bind some variables and which may or may not have some subterms. Then notations are used to mimic the typical concrete syntax of systems. And MMT does not build in a type system or any kind of equality. It doesn't even build in any of these constants. So everything you see comes from the systems. For example, the theory of LF would look like this in MMT. The middle column would be an MMT theory. You define the primitives of LF. You give them notations. And at that point, MMT, at that point, you can embed anything that you do in LF into MMT. Now the question is, how do you embed the LF type system? So question? Yeah. Um, if you go back, where you have this, um, can I do this? Yeah. So if you have here, when you have, so this you see some sees a, like a type or a term former. Gamma yeah. is the binders that tells us what uh, the bind variables, yeah. And these are and these are the arguments. Yeah. What well, does that mean that gamma binds in all of the arguments or in one of them? Yes. Like for instance, when you have a pi here. X yeah, so the variables bound are bound in all the arguments and on, and in subsequent variables. So x is going to be bound in e1 and in e2. No, only in e2. Ah, so maybe I'm, oh, because gamma carries the information also about, E1 would be part of gamma. Yeah, this would be okay. the gamma here declaring one variable. But wouldn't there be cases where you want to have several arguments and some of them bind some variables and others bind other variables? Like I think the J operator maybe in type. Yeah, that the, comes up too. Then yeah. you just so, use more than one constant here and do it that way. Uh, you mean like what? You give a compound term or what? Yeah. Or of course, if you're in a logical framework and you anyway have higher abstract syntax, then you're free to take any arguments you want and fine tune the. Sure, sure. Once you're in LF, it's clear. Yeah. But so I, I'm, I'm worried about this business of not being able to uh, abstract. Suppose I have E1 and E2, okay, for our arguments, and I want to bind some some variables in E1 and some like. I want to bind one variable in E1, and then I want to bind two variables in E2. What do I do? I bind three variables, or what? Um, so, like, yeah, you would need multiple constants to form a more complex compound term. I'm. I've also also that's thought about that problem. I'm specifically thinking about the pattern match operator, where every case has to introduce some new bound variables well the problem with compound with compound uh, constants is that if I, I if, if i think about the meaning of things then i might be very difficult to give the meaning yeah exactly so, constants so far this has proved to be a decent trade-off if you have some terms with very unusual binding structure i'd be very happy to get pointers from you mm -hmm. Like some challenge okay. cases. So the J operator, I think, is like that, if I'm not mistaken. In 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 the in, in, in type theory, in the identity type, the the eliminator, it will bind one variable in one place and it'll bind three variables in another place and so on. Yeah. So that would be an example, I think. Yeah, okay. Okay, go on. I mean another option, you can always, of course, in the typing rules then. Be more restrictive and reject terms where variables occur in places where MMT doesn't allow them. Because so far we're only representing the syntax and not the typing groups. Mm -hmm. The MMT has a couple of typing judgments. 
most importantly, typing is a binary relation between terms and equality is a binary relation between terms. And then the actual type checker works relative to a set of these rules. And each of these rules is supplied as a Scala object. So MMT is written in Scala. It uses a couple of abstract interfaces for specific rules. And so users just write those roots in Scala and inject them into the MMT type checker at runtime. So you don't have to recompile MMT. You write your roots in a separate project, tell MMT where they are, they're loaded at runtime, and they're immediately used in the kernel. Those roots are subject to the module system themselves. So you can put the typing roots in exactly those contexts in which you want them to be used. Let me jump forward to an example. Oh, 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 is there a well delineated, is, is there some part of the implementation that you could reasonably call the kernel, the trusted kernel? Yes and no. So, There is a kernel which implements a type reconstruction algorithm relative to these judgments, but it will use whatever rules you give it. Okay, so, so if you say module of the rules that the user provided, yeah, there is a kernel. Yeah. So if you provide rules that don't terminate or something like that, then of course there is no way MMT can stop you from doing that. Can the user provide uh, rules that directly break every, that directly produce lies? The rules are just trusted. Or yeah. is, there, yeah. is there some sort of- You can have a type checking rule that says I'm applicable to anything and I always return true. Okay. So if you want to see a bit more about what these rules look like, this is a file where I'm implementing the rules for LF. Put that in the Zoom chat. For LF, I need about eight rules. Every operator gets a type inference rule. I have a checking and equality rule at pi, a beta conversion rule. And then I have two rules that handle unknown types and unknown terms so that I can infer missing parts. And importantly, these rules are pretty easy to write. Like every rule is some 10 or so lines of Scala. And most of it is boilerplate so that you have nice error messages. And these roots don't see at all what happens in the module system or what happens with the type reconstruction algorithm. So you can implement your typing roots in a relatively naive, straightforward way, but then it generates the entire algorithm on top of that. So I could go into more detail on how these yes, rules. So let's ask the audience if there are other questions here, because I think I've, I've been dominating here the questions. So um, let's let's open the discussion to questions. Let's let's thank the speaker. Let's see how do I unmute you all. Wait wait wait! I have to unmute you all. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs> Okay, I muted you back, but you can unmute yourselves. So questions. If you have a question, I think we can try just unmute yourself and say, I have a question and ask. I have a meta, meta, meta question. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so um, what I'm not getting is, is um, suppose you take one of the examples that you gave, um, you apply you do what you do to to the isabel libraries and you spit out this large amount of mmt stuff what i'm not getting is what do we now do with that what's what what's so what's the point what's the use of of the of the mnt stuff that you've got out of say isabel or or cock
to recheck proofs. Sorry, you were muted there for 10 seconds. I muted you by okay. mistake, so please just start over. So I said that was a good question. So what do we do with the libraries once we have them? One person already asked, can we use it for rechecking the libraries? In principle, yes. But so far, the scalability hurdles are still too big to actually attack that. But there are a couple more low-hanging fruits that we can use. So one thing is just library integration, seeing which theorems are proved in which libraries, connecting libraries across systems, or just co-browsing libraries that you can see the same formalization in different systems. Or if you think about um, development of language independent support tool. So we can develop a search service once and for all on top of MMT, which you can then apply to any library we have. And even better, it would find results in all libraries in parallel. But, but would, it, would it be able to, to um, find something in the MMT stuff and then invert that back to find the, the relevant thing, say in, in Cock or Isabel, that, that, that it came from? Yes, so all the exports carry source references, so you can jump back from anything we have in MMT to the exact line in the source. I see, okay. Various libraries. Yeah. Great, thank so you. So one caveat for all of these applications is that they're really, really hard to do. And where we are right now is that we have the libraries. And we have done a couple of case studies in what can be done with them. But we've just sent the grant proposal for the follow-up project to actually do that at larger scales. So one thing we want to do first is to do a search service across libraries. Something else that could be interesting is to use um, machine learning technology on these libraries in a way that could learn from all libraries in parallel. Okay, any other questions? There's I have a, a question. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering, uh, early you said that, uh, well, like the idea of MMT is it's sort of a, a meta logical framework, but looking at your rules for the signatures, for the constants and the operators, it looks like um, MMT is itself a logical framework, and it looks like it's a, a subset of, uh, say, generalized algebraic theories, uh, as defined by Cartmel, uh, restricted such that, um, as Andrew was saying, you can only bind uh, variables in across all the arguments, some, some limitation on variable binding. Have you looked at Cartmel's work, and uh, is there a significant overlap there, I was wondering? So, if you look at the syntax, it's actually not that surprising that there are similarities because in the end, there aren't that many primitives that we need to represent formal syntax. We need to have composed terms, we need to have binding. There's a couple more details, maybe some literals, some records. But it is, it's not that hard to come up with that syntax. So it puts normal to have overlaps there. The expressivity of the system is maybe more determined by what kind of rules you can write about the, that syntax. And since the typing rules are written in, in Scala, you are extremely free to define arbitrary type theory. So so far, my experience has been that whatever I tried to define, I could define, even if I was originally skeptical. Like, I thought the near logic wouldn't work at all, and then I figured out the way to do it anyway. Can I ask a, sort of a clarifying question there? 
Um, so if I understand, so generalized type, the generalized, uh, the cardinals uh, generalized, what are the algebraic theories? There, I think you have a sort of a division which doesn't exist in MMT. So is it correct that in MMT, for instance, you could have Russell style universes, which is to mean you could have like a type, which like a type U such that U has type U. That's possible, right? Yeah, nothing would stop right. you from writing and a rule. Like also, you can, you can stick in proof irrelevance wherever you want. So for instance, you could have a, a rule which says that uh, some term needs to be constructed, let's call it A, and some other term needs to be constructed, let's call it B, but then the conclusion doesn't mention B. That's totally yeah. possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so a typing rule just gets the typing judgment as input and has to spit out the Boolean. Right. So I think this is rather more general than generalized type theories because it allows you to do things like just delete proof, like delete certain proof terms do not record types if you don't want to. Things can be types, like there can be recursion of any sort, right? Like you can have terms which have, are also types at the same time and so yeah. on. Right? I yeah. mean, you can even have side effects if you want. You can do arbitrary IO, run some other system to build something. Sure, sure, but just at the level that. of the, the syntax you were describing earlier, yeah. you had the little grammar. That one allows yeah. a lot more than what you normally get in type theories. Yeah. So the idea is really that once you have a really well thought out formal system with some kind of consistency proof on paper, you just implement it in MMT and then you trust it because your system is well designed. Mm -hmm. And then from that point on forward, you work declaratively inside that system. Any other questions? Yeah, I wanted to ask you about um whether there's any connection to metamath. So metamath is also very flexible with respect to the logical theory that you're working in. Um, maybe you could comment on that a little. Yes, yeah, so actually I guess Mario would be the best person to answer that because he actually wrote the metamath to MMT translator. So metamath is one of the systems that we've imported. Do we have a Mario here that will answer I the question? I don't think he's around, but you'll probably run into him sooner or later. Um, Does Mario have a last name? Canero. Oh, okay. Um, You're not going to run into him because of social distancing. Yeah, but <laughs> sooner or later. Um, I haven't looked at math, the math in that much detail, but from what I've seen, yeah, it's very similar. MetaMath also tries to be completely flexible in what happens later on. The, the way variable binding and substitution are treated is different, but I don't think that severely restricts what you can actually do down the line. Other questions? Okay, so maybe maybe it's more of a difference in goals where they try to formalize a lot of mathematics. You are maybe more interested in knowledge representation. Yeah, I mean, I could do other mass formalization. I would pick hold or set theory and then just start going. So it would probably be as much work to do a metamath style formalization in MMT as it is in metamath, because metamath also doesn't have that powerful proof support, at least last time I checked, and many proofs are done manually. Any more questions? I have a question actually. It's about uh, proof relevance. So you say that when you import like Cox stuff and Isabel stuff, you don't actually store proof terms. So for, Isa, uh, for Cox we do, for Isabel we don't. Right. So um, can actually you have some proof relevance or is um, and yeah, by default proof you have relevance. proof relevance and if you want to be proof relevant you have to just throw in an equality rule that makes things of certain types equal. 
Okay, but you cannot use any of the results from, for example, Isabel, because proof terms are not stored in there. What do you mean by use results? Isabel does not store its own proof terms. Isabel, by default, doesn't actually store proof terms. Yeah. Uh, let's be careful about what we mean by proof terms. It stores a thing called proof terms, but those are not complete derivations. Nor no, no, it stores only, only judgments, right? Only, only conclusions. It's well, that's what the kernel originally did, but so Macarius did a lot of work to really export the entire proof term, if you want it. It's off by default because the checking time is a bit higher. I think we take twice as long to run over the archive of formal proof with full proof term instrumentation, but it would be possible. And in, in fact, the also work Macarius did for the export is inside Isabel, so you could switch that on relatively easily if you're working with Isabel, if you wanted the proof term. But that's not even the biggest issue yet. If you really want to translate between libraries, which I think is the question here. Yeah, Peter is not around anymore, but there was a question in the chat yeah. whether you can translate between libraries. Also a question like that in the chat. And so the much, much bigger problem is that the type systems are entirely different and you have to find ways to match those up. The way the libraries are structured are entirely different and you have to find ways to match up the definitions. Already relatively basic things like, is division a binary operation that's partial or is it a total operation that takes the proof guard or is it the total operation that returns zero if you divide by zero. Like libraries diverge so much at already at fundamental levels that the much bigger challenge in practice will be to, to figure out what the theorems that you have on the other libraries even mean in the target library and how you can translate even just the statements. Why isn't this a problem in ordinary mathematics? Is it because ordinary mathematics just imagines that everything is compatible, but nobody actually knows? Or is it compatible and we're doing things wrong when we formalize things? Mathematicians abstract from the foundation entirely. And proof assistants for the last couple of decades have focused primarily on the foundation. So now the proofs we have in proof assistants are very strongly tied to the foundation they're written in, whereas mathematicians haven't done that at all. So they swap new foundations in flexibly. Oh, but let's, just, even let, this let's just take the example you mentioned, division, right? Surely there will be different treatments of division in different textbooks and then like somebody is going to have division as an operation. Somebody else is going to prove that every non-zero number has an exactly has precisely one inverse, and will say, well, therefore we can introduce an operation. It'll be slight little differences in how things are phrased, and somehow right. they're able to get across those differences informally, but not formally. So, either some, so, so something is not matching up. Yeah. But I think mathematicians are doing two crucial things differently. One is they have abstractions from the foundations. So it's not everything is just one huge library, but you have little theories where you keep track of your assumptions very carefully so that every result is stated relative to minimal assumptions, which makes pointing it much more easy. And secondly, they have been trained or have trained themselves to to match up these assumptions in, a, um, in their brains without having to write down the details. Yeah, I see you have a very high opinion of mathematicians. It's, it's very <laughs> good. Yes. Yeah, I do believe that we still have a lot of things to learn for proof assistant design from how mathematicians have been doing it. Definitely, yeah. So I'm not even sure if type systems were really the right way to go anymore. If you talk to mathematicians, they, they're very skeptical of using type systems. And 
maybe for good reasons. Well, but they're very skeptical of using any kind of formal systems for good reasons. Yeah, but even if you just talk about the fundamental language and the fundamental assumptions of the systems, the systems we have now don't really match up with mathematical intuitions very well. Yeah, I can agree on that, yeah. Other questions? I have a question. Um, is MMT intended as a foundational theory, much in the way like uh, Martin Love type theory or homotopy type theory? No, MMT would be one level above, meaning whatever foundational theory you have, you can define it in MMT. Why MMT. should we trust MMT? Oh, well, MMT shouldn't, so it's not MMT that competes with a native implementation of Martin Love type theory. It's your implementation of Martin Love type theory inside MMT that competes with a native one. So if you trust that you got the roots right in your native implementation, you can trust that you got them right in MMT. We also have to trust that you implemented correctly things like substitution and uh, right, of course. a couple of things, right? Yeah. So the syntactic, the syntactic transformations that MMT performs, you have to trust that those are correctly implemented. Yes. But so I think I got the abstraction quite nicely there in the sense that like the mathematically and types theoretically interesting parts are left to the user defined rules and MMT takes care of the bureaucracy. And yeah, you still have to trust that, but it's relatively easy to convince yourself that that was implemented correctly. So I would rather trust an implementation of theory X in MMT than a native implementation of theory X. Okay, maybe I can try a very naive question uh, and you can give me a very straight answer. <laughs> um, what would you say are the main goals of, F of MMT because it's it's not a proof assistant. It's not a foundational system. Um, in your mind, what is the goal? What is it that you're trying to achieve with MMT? Yeah, that's a very good question because almost all the research I do is somehow tied to MMT. So you're basically asking me what is my goal for my entire research career. And so when Michael Kuhn has pitched my PhD topic to me 15 years ago, he basically said, take all the stuff people do in the various formal systems and integrate that. And in a way, I'm still doing that. And as I go along, the problem just becomes bigger and the scope becomes larger. But that is like the 100 year horizon guiding the project. In terms of short term horizons, it's indeed extremely hard to prioritize. There's so many things that I want to do urgently. Like just recently, we completely generalized the scope. We used to work with mostly logics and formal systems. And then we realized, hey, let's also do programming languages. Let's also do databases. And we find very much of the, many of the principles developed in MMT for logics can carry over to those settings as well. So now we can look at how can we take all the data in mathematical databases, connect that with computer algebra systems and proof systems. So suddenly the scope of the problem exploded further. Right, so, so uh, one I can't of the give main you a better answer than that, that, I'm afraid. Yeah. So maybe it's an exploration of uh, the 
different ways to get interoperability in mathematics. Yeah. No, that's very much a, a thread that runs through everything. Okay. Thank you. And also, every time I come across a new community, a new system, I understand that community by mapping their ideas to MMT. If necessary, extending MMT to capture that system well. So I use it also like to just record my own understanding of how formal languages work and how mathematics works. Okay, we're now running like well, well over an hour. So maybe what we can do is uh, if there are, okay, so I'll ask if there are further questions that would be good for the entire audience here or you'd like to ask. Otherwise, I will suggest that we uh, thank the speaker again. Warning, I will unmute you all. So this could be a tricky business. Uh, and then we thank the speaker again. And uh, if anybody wants to chat a little more, you can stay uh, stay behind if you have something to ask Florian. And otherwise, thank you all for participating. And uh, next week, we are going to hear about Beluga from uh, Brigitte Pientka. So same time next week. So unmute and thank the speaker. Bye bye. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. So, Florian, don't just disconnect just yet. Let's see if anybody wants to say anything. Okay, um, oh, I muted you, there we go. Okay, thank you very much, that was very interesting. Um, Maybe you can stop the recording now. Yeah, I can stop the recording now, so let's do that, thank you.